this evening. Welcome on Facebook, welcome on YouTube. Just very, very thankful you're taking time out of your busy evening to be live with all of us here. Tonight we're talking about the secret to perfect landings. How we can work each and every time to make, well, each and every landing that much better. Let's give some shout outs before we get too far into this. Hey to everybody on YouTube. Um, hey to Gabriel, David, Jason, Joseph Aids. Nice to see you, James, uh, Gabriel, David, Brian, Mark, great to see you. Heading over to now Facebook. Hey to Eric, John, David, Patrick, uh, Steve, hey Neil in Ireland, nice to see you. Uh, Matt, Cole, Dan, Stephen, good to see you all as well. Uh, back over on YouTube, William, Scott, David, Dave B. Fantastic, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for taking time to find a different way to better yourself as a pilot. Tonight we'll be talking about the secret to perfect landings. Let me share with you some of my best tips to make your next landing, well, your best landing, and how to improve that each and every time. A little bit about how this works. Well, first off, I have, we're streaming live on YouTube and Facebook simultaneously right now, uh, so I can see the chat in front of me. So on YouTube, I can see Carl and Frank and Brian and Elise just posted some comments on YouTube. I can see Randy and Kendall and my buddy Jim Porterfield just posted some comments as well. You're going to see some of our great team in that chat as well. Some of our great team is here in the studios at M0A.com right now. Now, we have something very special. All my online ground school members know this. We have with us tonight world famous Russ on the Russ cam. Everyone, oh, that's a good Russ cam. You guys look real official tonight. Russ has his family photo in the background. Russ and Matt here. <laughs> Russ and Matt here in the studio. John is working the TriCaster and making all the magic happen behind the scenes. Uh, Ethan, uh, Celeste, uh, you'll see Sarah, you'll see quite a few others. Hunter uh, as well in there, uh, in the chat as well. So do say hi to some of the great M0A.com team as well. And say hi to Russ. Russ always needs affirmations in his life. So do say hi to Russ. Russ is our director of maintenance and our A&P mechanic here at M0A.com. Keeps everything everything running. A little bit about M0A.com. You can tell we have a lot of fun at work. We love what we do sharing aviation. Uh, what we truly do is we're a full online ground school. We're so much more than just those YouTube videos you see out there on YouTube, on Facebook. It's great. It's amazing content. I, I love when people come up to us at Sun and Fun and Oshkosh. They go, Jason, listen, I apologize. I've never bought one of your products before, but I love your videos. We're all about that. Please continue continue to consume that content and share, that is what it's there for. We're a complete uh, online ground school, private instrument commercial, fundamentals of instruction, uh, and just an amazing course. How many online ground school members or previous uh, alumni online ground school members do I have on here? If you could just type in me in the chat on YouTube, on Facebook, so I can give you a shout out there as well. Uh, but just, a, we're not teaching just to pass a knowledge test just to pass a check ride. We're creating safer, smarter pilots. You can see all this coming in. Thank you, Brian, Drew, Mark, Glenn, Zach, Jack, Robert, Jason, Michael, Jimmy, Drew. So many coming in. Adam, Jay, thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys are absolutely fantastic. John, thank you so much. Really appreciate you all. Uh, Reed, good to see you as well. So uh, some of you have seen some of our great books as well, our check ride prep books, our Rusty Pilot movie we have, Flying Again as well on DVD and Blu-ray, as well as we just, I uh, just was sharing this with the team, the Private Pilot Blueprint in the bottom right hand corner of your screen is a free book. I'll ask that you pay shipping, privatepilotblueprint.com. We, we, know for a fact we're over 25,000, we actually estimate we're over 30,000 of those books uh, in the hands of potential pilots. Very, very blessed to be able to share that with you all as well. And very, very blessed uh, to share this 
because of amazing, amazing customers. That's why we call you the M0A Nation. M0A.com in 2017 made the Inc. 500 list as number 230, the 230th fastest growing private company in America. And this year, 2018, uh, number 578. Just missed the 500 cutoff, landed on the 5,000 list, but still one of the fastest growing private companies in America. And we're blessed beyond belief. That's because of amazing people like yourself, amazing clients. That Missouri Nation is so powerful. And we're so thankful for that. I can't wait to meet uh, all of you. Let's talk about this. Let's start with a question here. What makes a great landing? What, if you had to summarize, just in the chat, I'm, I'm looking at all the chats here now, what makes a great landing? Just, just tell me, I mean, is it, okay, we have the old funny saying, any land you can walk away from is a good landing. Yeah, okay, that's fine, but tell me, what makes a good landing here? So many comments coming on YouTube right now. Uh, I can't read names, I'll just read what they say. Stable approach, um, a good pattern, we're gonna talk about that. Stable approach, great approach, airspeed, username Squawk VFR is using my exact words. I can't read YouTube, the comments are coming in so fast here. Let's see if Facebook's any better over here. Patterns, patterns, approaches, um, absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> yes, yes, um, smooth one, yep, absolutely, coordinated, airspeed, yep, no float, no bounce, yes, a lot of you guys have, have read or seen videos on this topic of the secret to perfect landings before, a lot of you know certainly what is coming, stay, who said this, stay ahead of the plane, Glenn on YouTube, fantastic advice. So if I had to summarize it, I just asked what makes a great landing. And you said airspeed, you said a nice pattern, you said a stable approach, um, you know, airspeed is king we talk about, all these things. You just gave me the ingredients for a great landing. Well, let me ask you another question then. Why are landings so difficult? Or better asked, what makes landings so difficult? Why are landings difficult for you? Let me know in the chat real quick. What makes landings so difficult? When you have a bad landing, trust me, we all have bad landings. Russ has bad landings all the time, it seems like, but we're working on it. It's a work in progress. <laughs> Russ didn't see that, we didn't, that wasn't scripted. That was, that was just a good. Yeah, it was a bad landing last time, you're right. <laughs> Ground comes up too fast, crosswinds, um, no two landings are the same, lack of currency or recurrency. Someone said flaring, someone said slipping, timing, coordination, wind, big one, yeah. I pick on Russ a lot, by the way. Um, let's see here. Um, every landing is different over on Facebook, constantly changing conditions, making sure we're appropriately configured, decision making, distractions. Absolutely, Judge, judging height over the runway, Frank uh, mentioned, we're gonna talk about that, I have a video coming out on Tuesday about that exact topic, actually. What makes landing so difficult? Absolutely all these things. The environment we operate in, we fly in, certainly makes these landings so difficult. So with that, you all know myself uh, well enough by now uh, that you know I teach through stories. And I have a, a quick story. It's an old story. Many of you have heard the story uh, before. Give me one second. It's a, it's a story from my pre-solo days. And here I was, uh, a young teenager, and I was getting ready to solo this Cherokee 140. And I was kind of getting the hang of landings, and I was, I was not the perfect student. I loved flying the airplane, but I wasn't spending the time in the books like I should have. Now, ironically, look what we do for a living, right? Now, we, that's all we do is encourage on videos and do that book learning with that, right? I wasn't that ideal student early on. All I wanted to do was fly. And I remember my instructor, very, very, uh, just an awesome instructor, very nice lady. She said, Jason, if you can land on runway eight and two six at the Ocala Airport, previously we land on 3618, which is the 7,000 foot monster, 200 feet wide, I mean, it's just this huge runway, it's easy. If you can land on runway eight and two six, which is just a few thousand feet, it's 50 feet wide, coming from this 150 foot wide runway to a 50 foot wide runway was intimidating. We come in over this industrial park, there's some power lines right by the road, 
It's a very intimidating approach. She said, you can land on runway eight and two six, I'll solo you. And that's all I needed to hear. I, I, was, I was so up, I was so excited for that challenge of, of doing that. So here I am, I'm coming in to land. And I screwed up a long time ago on the down. I was too fast, I was too high. On base, I'm kind of skidding through my turn. I get on final, and I didn't have the sight picture. You know what I mean when I say the sight picture of such a narrow runway? Again, I've only been landing on 1836. It's 150 feet wide. It's 7,000 feet long. It's a sight picture I'm used to seeing. Now give me a 3,000 foot long runway by 50 feet wide. And here I am on final. And I'll get Mike Zulu out here to make it more realistic, even though I was in a Cherokee 140 here. And I was way left of final. And I was way right of final. And I kept just doing these S turns out there on final. Meanwhile, my instructor, uh, Mary is her name, and she was just sitting there, kind of with her arms folded, just waiting. And I'm going, I'm all over the place. And finally, I am so far left of final. I'm talking, I see the runway out the, out the right window. There is just grass underneath of me. The runway is way over there. And I'm like trying to save this landing. Have you ever made the mistake of just trying to save a landing? We all know what we should have done, right? We should have gone around. So finally, she says to me, Jason, what are you going to do? And I'm looking at the runway way over here. And I think, well, Mary, I'm going to go around. And she goes, I think that's an excellent idea. And the first thing I did, now I was flying a Cherokee 140. If you're flying a Cherokee 140, you can relate to this. It has the manual flaps, right? Three, three notches. I had full flaps in. I grabbed the manual flaps and I took out all the flaps at once. What happens in any airplane when you take out all the flaps at once before you add power, right? That's not our proper go-round procedure. That airplane sank like a rock. And when I tell you the runway was way out there, right? We hit the grass so hard. Obviously, it's not intended for us to land. We were in the, the grass between the, we were even past the taxiway. We were so far left. Someone said to me, Jason, it's a miracle you didn't hit a runway sign. I said, no, the runway signs and the taxiway signs are close to the runway and taxiway. I was so far left. I was 50 yards left of the runway. And we hit the grass. And Mary got on the controls and, and pulled the yoke back and did a, what I now and, and later realized was a proper soft field technique. My first soft field landing we, was uneventful. We could use the airplane again, taxied back onto the pavement. And I remember it was dead quiet. It felt like the longest taxi back. I was shaking. I was so nervous. And I literally remember thinking, maybe I'm just not meant to be a pilot. I, I, this landing stuff is so hard. Maybe I just, I, I'm not gonna get it. My next flight lesson I canceled because I was too embarrassed to show up. I was, I was positive the whole airport was talking about Jason and his, and his terrible landing, right? But I, I found that encouragement actually came from, from my mother, my father, who gave me the encouragement to go back out there and, and uh, go to that next flight lesson. I ended up soloing shortly after that, but the reason I did is because I became a student of landings. You see, sometimes in a traumatic experience like that, you can either become a recluse like I attempted to do, like I don't want to ever be a pilot again, I'm not meant to do this, this isn't for me. Or you can look at it as how can I take this and how can I become the best possible pilot? I became a student of landings. And what I discovered are one of two things. I discovered two things held me back from making those perfect landings. If you're taking notes, you're going to want to write these down as we go through these here. The first thing is this. A perfect landing starts with a perfect pattern. Commit that to your memory. So many of you commented like this already. A perfect landing starts the perfect landing. Some of you understand this. A perfect landing starts with a perfect traffic pattern. By that, I mean no trapezoids. You know what I mean by a trapezoid, right? Every edge is kind of a little bit different. We're looking for a rectangle. No shortcuts. We can't cut corners here. We have to have that proper structure here. We have to fly that perfect pattern is what we're really shooting for. Now, 
Flying that perfect pattern is difficult because we have to deal with things like wind and other factors that play into this. So we could be flying our traffic pattern here, as you can see. And sorry, let me start that up for you again. We could be flying our traffic pattern here, as you can see us entering in. And here we are, the 45 to downwind. This is some of the great animations. We have a, a wonderful animator here at mzeroy.com does all our animations in our online ground. So we make our beautiful 45 degree entry, and now I have a tailwind. Are we compensating for that tailwind? Now I get ready to turn, in this case, we'll call it crosswind for the sake of this. This is more like a rectangular course uh, demonstration. But can you see the wind correction angle? Are you properly crabbing into the wind? Then do we compensate for the fact that I'm turning back into the wind? Do you understand that we have an increase in airflow heading over the wings, right? So we have to adjust for that. And then we can turn again in the rectangular course example, we turn the next 90 degrees. And do we have now the opposite wind correction angle to the other side this time and making those adjustments for the wind? That's what's important. And that's what we focus on. You see a maneuver like rectangular course, it gets neglected so much, it's not fun to do ground reference maneuvers, turns around a point, rectangular course, these sort of things. It's, it's not always enjoyable, but we have to learn to focus on them. I want you to do an exercise with me here relatively quickly. I am a huge fan of chair flying. If you are not chair flying, you're doing yourself a disservice, truthfully. I mean, the Blue Angels chair fly, they literally my chair fly, we're, we're visualizing and, and seeing everything as it's happening. The Blue Angels will stand on the ramp in formation as they are, make the same radio calls, do the same maneuvers, practice just like they would, breathe the same way they would before each and every demonstration here. We as pilots should be chair flying our maneuvers, and in this case, chair flying our actual landings is what we're going to work towards. So chair fly this with me here. Let's imagine here we're on the downwind, we're already in the traffic pattern. We're whatever your traffic pattern altitude is, let's call it 1,000 feet, because in Florida, AGL and MSL are about the same. I've got my traffic pattern altitude of 1,000 feet, and I'm cruising quite well on the downwind. Now, on the downwind, I want to make sure of one thing. I want to bring that throttle back. Bring that throttle back. You see, the same cruise RPMs that got me to that airport, that 23, 2400, is not the same RPMs I need in the traffic pattern. Oftentimes we descend into the traffic pattern at a cruise RPM setting when really you need to take about five to 10% off of that. Let's drop it on back instead to like 20 to 2100 RPMs, just a little bit, a tiny adjustment. If I'm on the downwind and it's truly I'm landing into the wind, so on the downwind I have the wind behind me, I've already got the wind helping me out with my actual ground speed, my speed across the ground, I don't need those extra RPMs here. You've heard me say it a million times. It's this idea that airspeed is king. I, it was just in my last video. It will forever be in m0a.com videos, this phrase that airspeed is king. On downwind, what is the best possible airspeed for your aircraft. Is it 90 miles an hour knots? We're not gonna get into that now, but what is right for your aircraft? For us and, and Mike Zulu, typically what we'll shoot for is 90 on downwind, slowing to 80 on base, 70 on final, and slowing to 65 towards 60 over airport property is what we're shooting for here. Airspeed is king. I said a perfect landing starts with a perfect traffic pattern. Managing your airspeed in that traffic pattern is paramount. Now, while I'm on that downwind, I've brought the throttle back. I'm remembering that Jason said airspeed is king, so I'm aiming for 90. I don't wanna be too fast. I don't wanna to be too, too slow. I can screw up a perfectly good landing way out here on the downwind. 
I'm a thousand feet away from that runway and I could already set myself up for success or failure based on my airspeed. Another thing to think about is, am I too close to that runway? Am I creeping in on it? Is the wind, I have a little bit of crosswinds blowing me towards that runway? Or am I flying a bomber pattern and I'm way out here from my runway, right? We have to see, am I creeping in, creeping away from the runway? Am I too wide? Am I too tight on my downwind? Ask your instructor to show you where should I be on downwind and look and commit that sight picture to memory. So we're remembering that airspeed is king. When I come up, and I'm very procedural in this, when I come up and I'm a beam my touchdown point, you're still chair flying with me, right? When I'm a beam my touchdown point, I start my procedures again. In two, three Mike Zulu, I'm, I'm carb rated. So it's carb heat, power back, 10 degrees of flaps. And it's in that order. Carb heat, power back, 10 degrees of flaps. Why is it in that order? Well, carb heat always comes on first before I adjust the throttle. That's just a safety thing. Throttle comes back, and when I say throttle comes back, throttle comes back to like where you do your run up, 1700, 1800, 1900, just bring it back a little bit. And then add the flaps. Why in that order? What would happen if I just added the flaps in first? Where on my airplane would the nose want to go if I just, if I had 2100 RPMs in and I just added flaps, 10, 10 degrees of flaps all of a sudden, where would the nose go? Right? That nose would want to go up, wouldn't it? All day, that nose would want to go up. Now, here I am trying to slow down, trying to get down, trying to maintain proper altitude, trying to realize the airspeed is king. I had 10 degrees of flaps, and now I went from 1,000 feet to 1,100 feet. And I have an extra 100 feet to lose. A perfect landing starts with a perfect traffic pattern, and I'm not off to a very good start if I do that. I'm very procedural, a beam my touchdown point, meaning a beam where I want the wheels to touch. Maybe it's the end of the runway, maybe it's the numbers, maybe it's the beginning of the second center line stripe, it doesn't matter. A beam my touchdown point, carb heat, power back to 1700 RPMs, 1800 RPMs, depends on your airplane, 10 degrees of flaps. And now I make sure I start my way down. I'm looking at that vertical speed indicator, making sure it's starting down. I want the vertical speed indicator coming down, and I want my airspeed slowing a little bit. That seems so counterintuitive. How can I put the nose down and have the VSI go down, that makes sense, and have the airspeed slow down a little bit? It's all in control. So many of you, we open up this webinar, and you said, what makes a great landing? You said, a stabilized approach. This is a huge part of having a stabilized approach. Now, I'm gonna to continue to fly that on out. And what am I waiting for next? Again, very procedural. I'm looking back and I'm waiting for that 45 degree point off that same touchdown point. The same touchdown point when I was a beam, car repeat, power back, 10 degrees of flaps. Now, when it's a 45 degree angle, over my left shoulder, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna make my base turn. And I make my base turn. I like to turn and talk. It's the, if I'm at a pilot controlled airport, it's much easier to spot a turning aircraft. I make that base turn. When I roll out wings level, I'll add my next notch of flaps. I can adjust the throttle. The throttle doesn't have to stay back where I left it. I can adjust that throttle more, just, just millimeters to bring that back. Very procedural. A perfect landing starts with a perfect pattern. What does that perfect pattern look like? Think about it. You ever played basketball or, or, or enjoy basketball? Watch a basketball player at the free throw line. They do the same thing every time. They dribble the ball twice. They spin it once. Whatever their routine is before they shoot, right? The same every time. I understand we're at different airports and different conditions and different aircraft. We have to work to try to get some constant in our life, right? Having these procedures. So let's get back to chair flying. We're on base here. Now on base, I'm asking myself a question here. On base, I'm asking myself, am I too high, am I too low, or am I right on glide path? Way out here on base, now I should have lost a little bit of altitude after my touchdown point, you know, going to that 45 degree point on my downwind. On base, I'm still losing altitude and slowing my airspeed. And I'm asking the question, am I too high? Am I too low? And am I right, or am I right on glide path? And what do I do about that? I'm not gonna adjust the nose for any of these. If I'm too high, what do I do? 
I just take out a little bit of power. Leave the nose where it's at, nose down. Because if your airspeed is right, well, you're pitched for that airspeed. We pitch for airspeed, we power for altitude. The day that you understand that phrase is, is an amazing, amazing day. You're going to hear it over and over. I pitch for airspeed, I power for altitude. I promise to you one day it's just going to click. You're going to say, wow. Very, very powerful when you truly understand that. So if I pitch for airspeed, I power for altitude. If I'm too high, I bring the power back a little bit, millimeters, uh, 200 RPMs, whatever it may be, just a little bit. Am I too low? I'm going to give it a little bit of power. Or my ride on glide path, I'm going to maintain everything. Now I'm getting ready to turn final. And I'm kind of watching the runway out here. I'm knowing what, and understanding what the wind is doing. I don't want to turn too early and have to adjust, but I certainly would rather that over turning too late and overshooting the runway. You realize you can go around at any point in the traffic pattern. So if I blow through final, I'm not going to want to make a steep turn at 800 feet, 700 feet back to final. I'm just going to go around on the base. If anything, I'd rather you roll out a little bit too early and learn how to time it out better that way. But I turn final. On final, I'm asking myself the same question. Am I too high? Am I too low? Am I right on glide path? And I'm making those adjustments. I'm adding flaps if necessary. And then on final, I always pick a point on the runway. And it's different than my touchdown point. It's something I called my aiming point. You'll hear me say this often in our short field videos. I always have an aiming point. The aiming point is ahead of my touchdown point because I know my airplane is going to float. It floats, Mike Zulu, 23 Mike Zulu, 172, floats a whole lot more than, say, a Piper Arrow. Those of you who fly Piper Arrows know exactly what I'm talking about when I say that, right? How, how little a arrow actually floats. Mike Zula 172, depending on fuel and loading, it can float quite a bit. And we can make those actual adjustments. But I have an aiming point. And I look at that runway. And I'd love to do a video like this one day where we literally make a circle on the windshield and put that aiming point in that circle and watch. And as that aiming point maybe goes up the windshield, what's happening, right? I'm getting too low. I need to bring that aiming point back up into my circle. Or what if the aiming point starts to disappear underneath the cowling? I'm too high. I need to make those adjustments. Have that aiming point ahead of where you actually are going to touch down, usually about 100 feet in front of where you're going to or where you intend to touch down. We want to pick that point on the runway here. And then here's the second and what I believe is the most important step. The first step was to understand that a perfect landing starts with a perfect traffic pattern. No trapezoids, no shortcuts. Remember, airspeed is king, and have your procedure down. The second, and I believe, truly believe, the most important step, and this is the hardest for people to grasp, because we are brought up using this word over and over. Even non-aviators understand this word. It is to ditch the word flare from your vocabulary. Ditch the word flare from your vocabulary. Instead, replace it with the word transition. Replace it with the word transition here. Allow me to explain why. The space shuttle, when it used to fly and come in for landing, it would flare on landing. When you're coming in on that 737, that 777, it flares on landing. A Cessna 172 doesn't flare. A flare is a, is a, is a quite extreme attitude for a 172. Now, I am not saying have a three-point landing. I'm asking you to transition. And what I want you to transition to is slow flight down the runway. Tuesday's video is that exact topic of slow flight down the runway. One of the most powerful things you can do is do slow flight down the runway. If you have a problem 
judging your height above the runway, you need to practice slow flight down the runway. You see, it truly teaches you to understand the aircraft in that configuration when there's only 60 knots of wind flowing over the wings and over the control surfaces. It just needs a little bit more input here. We transition, we don't flare. If you ever find yourself coming into land and you've pitched up so much that you can't see the runway, you flared and a little bit too much at that. We should transition. I should take my eyes down that runway. When I transition that nose up into slow flight down the runway, I transition my eyes down that runway. If you say, Jason, the runway just sneaks up on me, I'm flying, I'm flying, all of a sudden, there's the runway. You're looking too close. You need to take your eyes and look down the runway. Look towards the tree line, look thousands of feet down the runway as you transition the nose, so you transition the eyes. Let me give you my best landing tips and I'll let you get back to enjoying your evening here. Slow flight down the runway. The video comes out Tuesday. You won't want to miss it, trust me. If you struggle with landings, if you struggle with, with having great landings, if you struggle with when the heck is the runway coming, slow flight down the runway is going to benefit you greatly with that here. Take your eyes down the runway here. As you transition the nose, so you transition your eyes down the runway. Airspeed is king and aim for a perfect traffic pattern. One little quick thing to share with you all here, I'm giving away a Bose A20 headset October 1st. I'll be announcing the winner live and some other great M0A.com gear, including online ground school memberships and everything else, M0A.com forward slash Bose to go ahead and check that out. I imagine with all of you hitting the website at one time though, it's gonna slow down just a little bit, so do uh, it, it just be patient with it if it's, uh, if it's not loading properly, because last time we did this, we actually crashed the website. So uh, take some time on that. mzrocom forward slash Bose, no spam, uh, nothing like that. Not gonna, it would never sell your information, it would never spam you, just great aviation content and a great chance to win a Bose A20 headset. mzrocom forward slash Bose. I hope you guys enjoyed all that. Any questions? Let's open it up now to Q&A. Let's take just a few little questions. It really doesn't have to be about landings. It could be anything. And did you get a lot out of this? Is, is there something you, you learned here that say, man, I can take this. My next flight lesson, I'm going to run with this. And we can make all of that work. I can't wait to hear about your success regarding that here. Let's go ahead. Let's take some questions here. Sorry I wasn't as looking at the chat that much. I see Russ was just chatting up over there on Facebook. Um, all right, let me see here. Um, I want you, someone asked about how much should I pay attention to the flight instruments on YouTube, and I'm sorry the comments are coming so fast. I want, <sighs> airspeed is king. Uh, in, it's funny because I have, I have a I have Jamie Beckett's on here. I have Jamie Beckett's 1940 J3 Cub that is um, a gorgeous, gorgeous airplane. And I have a Cub, Piper Cub, airspeed indicator here. All I need in that airplane is an airspeed indicator. This is all looking outside. This is, this is a lot of one day with enough hours, you're going to get to the point where you can just hear, literally by the wind rushing over the wing, that the props, by the props spinning, this airplane's flying too fast, this airplane's flying too slow, and you look at the airspeed indicator to confirm that. You're gonna get to that level of expertise one day, I promise, but for now, I want you to look outside and looking at that airspeed indicator. Someone asked on YouTube, should we hear the stall warning horn during landing? Absolutely, if I'm looking for a full stall landing, I could hear it. Stall warning horn, wheels hit. In that order, right? Not stall warning horn, smash. Right? Stall warn horn, then we hear the chirp of the wheels. I am all about that. That is an excellent landing. Not a problem here. Um, let me see here. Someone asked for a video on the traffic pattern at night. That'd be a great thing. Night landings are always very, very intimidating. 
Harvey talked about maintaining the center line. The video on slow flight down the runway on Tuesday is going to talk about that. You have to realize the power of slow flight down the runway, you'll see it in the video. I literally take the yoke and go like this, yet the wings don't move. I think when you practice slow flight aloft, you can do the same thing, the wings will hardly do anything. You do that at a full cruise speed, right? You're gonna really, really, like you're rocking your wings, flying into Oshkosh, you're sun and fun. So again, really focus on that and attempt slow flight and practice slow flight down the runway. That's gonna help you just so, so much here. Brian, hey Brian, good to see you on here. Brian's one of our lifetime online ground school members. So why do I always land better at night? Listen, that's quite the opposite because most people don't land well at night. Perhaps it's forcing you to take your eyes down that runway and look to those lights and use the peripheral vision a little bit more with that here. Slow flight down the runway. I cannot stress it enough. I'm telling you here. Uh, JL on YouTube said, how she manage runway with perception on landing? It's like the story I started off with. Here's a 150 foot wide runway, then come up to this narrow runway. You have to see each to truly understand. And you also have to know the common illusions with this, right? Coming into a, a very narrow runway, the tendency can be to sometimes to come in too high because it looks so little down there. Right? I feel, or I feel like I'm way, I feel like I'm way up here. So I ended up making a poor approach, feeling like I'm much higher than I really am. A wide runway creates the opposite illusion. So on this can be even magnified at night as well. Different things to, uh, different things to think about. Um, uh, on YouTube, someone asked, when does the throttle go to idle in the traffic pattern? When I'm on final and I know I have that runway made, I typically baby the throttle back to idle when I know I have the runway made, meaning if I bring the throttle back to idle and the engine quits, I'm making it. I just said I have the runway made. So focus on that here. Uh, that's gonna be great. Um, Rocky says, any tips for my first solo tomorrow? Very, very excited about that, Rocky. You need to be getting some sleep here soon, my friend. Wake up, eat a great breakfast, feel completely refreshed, Go to bed chair flying, just like we talked about. Visualize that perfect traffic pattern. Say the radio calls in your head, just like you're going to. Make it as realistic as possible. A lot of our online ground school members, I've seen pictures. They'll go in their driveway with chalk or in their yard with, with spray paint and, and paint a runway or just chalk and make a runway in their driveway and they'll walk down this fictitious runway two, three, whatever it is make their radio calls and walk the entire thing just like the Blue Angels literally do and chair fly it that way. Chair flying is a powerful, powerful thing and I encourage you to do that. So listen, thank you so much for all that you guys and gals do. Thank you so much for making m0a.com what it truly is today. You are just such a blessing to myself and this great team here at m0a.com. We're gonna to continue to do great live streams like this on a monthly basis. We're continuing to produce great weekly YouTube content for you all. On Tuesday, Slow Flight Down the Runway comes out. The day before that, the Monday, I'm gonna announce the winner of the Bose headset live as well, plus some other great shirts, mzuri.com gear, uh, memberships, etc. for you all to check out with that. So uh, listen, if there's anything, Anything at all we can do this week, this month, this year to make you a safer, smarter pilot, please, please, please don't hesitate to reach out. Enjoy the rest of your evening and most importantly, remember that a good pilot is always learning. Have a great night, guys. We'll see you.